Hey folks, and uh, welcome back to the Bat of Doom track uh, for this afternoon. Uh, we're continuing our technical program um, with Chris and Dan uh, from Stack Titan. Uh, you might have already seen them in some of their other interactions with KernelCon. They just came off with some uh, excellent training. We've got a new book out. I assume there'll be a plug for that somewhere in the slide deck. Um, but uh, they're going to be talking uh, for the next hour or so about uh, better phishing through Smarter Interface, and um, I think it'll be an interesting talk. Uh, please get your questions into Discord, and uh, I will proxy them to the speakers at the end of their presentation. If you want to uh, find the speakers later, uh, they are tagged with the speaker role, so they'll show up as blue in Discord. All right, I don't, I don't remember who's talking first, so Chris, Dan, take it away. All right, cool. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. And uh, first off, um, awesome job putting the, uh, putting the conference together. We definitely appreciate, uh, you know, speaking at KernelCon. Obviously, this is our first time speaking at KernelCon, but it um, should be fun. Um, name of this uh, this talk really is Better Fishing Through Smarter Infrastructure. Um, and we'll, you know, just kind of talking through some of uh, some of the day in day out things that we uh, we run into from a, a fishing standpoint, um, and really kind of you know uh, really how we see the it could be better. Uh, some of those 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 sorts of things. Before we get started, uh, kind of a who am I type of plug. Uh, my name is Chris Patton. My co-founder of Stack Stack Titan with me is uh, obviously Dan Copeman, also co-founder of uh, Stack Titan. Um, we wrote a, uh, as Tim mentioned, we wrote a bathroom reader called Black Hat Go. Really, um, yeah. If you guys want to uh, uh, take a look at that, if you're interested in pen penetration testing and uh, you know the Go programming language, by all means, it's uh, there's there's about three years of work that probably could have been compressed uh, into uh, you know <clears throat> about six months, but that's uh, another story. Um, Spoken at the various conferences, those sorts of things, um, DEF CON, you know, a number of different B sides, Black Hat. Uh, those types of uh, those types of items, and then uh, you know we bug hunt, uh, we do reverse engineering, those sorts of uh, items. We've written a bunch of uh, open source uh, software, uh, try to contribute back to the back to the community. You know, kind of standard standard pair. Uh, Dan, anything you want to say about the uh, intro? Um, I think just with our history is probably, you know, we, we moonlight in a lot of these things, but probably our, our primary, um, you know, historical experiences is around penetration testing, you know, social engineering, offensive security and adversarial uh, security assessments. So um, that's kind of our niche. And then we, uh, you know, we do some of this stuff we moonlight as, as authors and bug hunters and whatnot. Okay, yeah, that's kind of where our experience comes from. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So what's the agenda? Um, so like I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, fishing in its current state, what we see on a day in day out uh, basis from an operation standpoint, or not so much of an operation standpoint per se, um, really kind of what we feel could be better uh, when there is a fishing engagement, um, when you're tasked with fishing uh, against an organization, uh, you know, a group, of, a group of individuals, whatever your target of interest might be. Um, and then uh, really kind of how, how we can improve that through smarter infrastructure. And we'll kind of, uh, we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, we will talk about that. Um, <clears throat> basically how we can stand up better infrastructure uh, to kind of help uh, instrument and operationalize what we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to do. And then uh, lastly, um, we've got a little bit of a gift for our red team friends. Uh, obviously something that we created that we'd like to release uh, to help, uh, you know, help the community uh, do more complex, uh, fishing campaigns. So current state, <clears throat> excuse me. These are things that we deem not red team approved. Um, so when we're talking about fishing uh, engagement, and there's kind of a, a number of preconceived notions that uh, uh, are preconceived items that kind of kind of happen. Uh, probably many of you who do this for a living uh, are constrained with, you know, probably scope limitations. Uh, you know, you're not necessarily allowed to uh, perform phishing as a means to, uh, as, as an attack vector to gain, you know, uh, access uh, into, you know, into an organization, into an internal environment. Um, so really some of the things that we see are commodity-based tools that, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, some of these tools, right? But a lot of them need to be customized in order to operate the, the way that they really truly should. And again, this is an opinion piece. I'm going to call this slide an opinion piece, right? This, um, because some may disagree, but at the same point, I think there are commodity tools uh, that are kind of set and forget, and they don't have a whole lot of um, intelligence around 
mm -hmm. around how how they're how they're executed. Um, maybe uh, you have to you, you have to add on to them. There's a general approach, uh, which is uh, kind of almost a fire and forget uh, type of methodology. Uh, again, I think there's some uh, some additional uh, thought that has to go into how you want to execute a fishing engagement. Uh, it's going to be very well planned. Um, some of the campaigns uh, may not necessarily align with um, what's required for an organization. I'll give an example. Uh, you know, if you're, if you engage in a fishing exercise, you send in a fishing campaign and you're trying to, get, um, <clears throat> you're trying to get credentials. So for instance, credentials, uh, but your reconnaissance uh, found that, you know, you've got a lot of multi-factor authentication on the perimeter um, across the board, right? Maybe that doesn't necessarily make sense. Maybe there's something else that you really need to focus on. Um, so again, if you're doing this in kind of a contrived, um, if you're doing it in kind of a contrived uh, uh, environment or example, uh, let's say scenario, then maybe it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't necessarily make sense. You don't have insight into the rest of the environment, those sorts of things, right? And that's, again, some of the constraints that are, our limitations with performing, um, you know, fish engagements kind of uh, in, in their own autonomy, right, by themselves. Um, and this kind of goes along with decoupled from it, from the attack. Um, point four is basically, you know, me or us just trying to say that, again, fishing engagements, um, I believe that, you know, when you're doing it from an adversarial uh, perspective, they should be part of the overall engagement, right? They should be part of, you know, say for instance, a red team, uh, uh, red team exercise, they should be part of, uh, you know, the, the overall penetration test. Um, and then when you're sending in some of these phishing uh, uh, campaigns, again, if you're just doing click-throughs, uh, if you're just doing metrics, statistics, those sorts of things, a lot of times they're unrealistic payloads. Um, okay, you know, if, if you're just looking, again, if you're looking for someone to, to click uh, and open a macro that fires an IP address back uh, off domain, uh, something like that, or if you're just looking for, uh, you know, someone who's visited, uh, for instance, a website uh, as, as, you know, a potential water hole, water hole or simulated water hole attack, um, that's not necessarily, uh, again, re relevant for a, uh, a true adversarial attack. And then last, lastly, if you've whitelisted your email sender, um, then at that point, I mean, you're, you're strictly doing kind of a GRC type of uh, engagement, right? This is more so uh, you're, you're absolutely looking for metrics. You're absolutely looking for statistics, uh, those sorts of things in order to fulfill some kind of security awareness training um, that's, you know, on a, on a basis. Dan, yeah, so the, I think to add on to that, that, as Chris said, this is kind of an opinion piece here. So uh, that's not to say that commodity tools and, and these types of, of uh, motivations, um, they don't serve a purpose. Um, that's not what we're saying. I think what we're trying to say is that maybe there's a maturity model when it comes to performing social engineering engagements and spear phishing and kind of these commodity type tools that are just measuring metrics. They're good for baselining uh, security awareness, but they aren't necessarily a realistic, um, a realistic measurement of, of an organization's ability to withstand a legitimate attack, right? So we feel like there's kind of a gap that, that needs to be, uh, you know, closed in there. And a lot of times, you know, we've seen organizations come in and do uh, spear phishing attacks where it's, it's, they're, they're calling it kind of an advanced, uh, you know, fish customized to an organization, but it, it's legitimately just a canned template out of a commodity tool that they're sending. And it, it kind of does a disservice to the organization itself if they already have baselines and they want to, they want something more, right? And so I, I feel like that, that gap needs to kind of be closed. Yeah, that's a great point. That was more eloquent. Um, so, and then, you know, kind of building upon that, uh, we call this like the general feedback loop or the generic fishing cycle, right? Um, so kind of, again, if we're talking about uh, just sending in a campaign and then expecting results, typically the the method, you know, the methodology is spin up the tool of choice, right? Um, it's probably gonna be some kind of framework uh, that's probably gonna be, you know, it's probably gonna spin up the same listener, right? So the, the same, uh, the same client that's sending in the uh, the fish, uh, the actual the email is probably probably has the same listener, right? So you can see the problem there. Uh, they create a payload content. Um, again, might be you know it might be a commodity based payload. Uh, maybe there's maybe there's some additional thought that was put into it, you know. Um, but send the fish, 
await some kind of user uh, user action, right? And then uh, you hopefully evade detection. But if you've kind of done maybe some of these sorts of things without actually testing it, and I would sit that, you know, I'm going to put emphasis on that. You know, anytime you build up the infrastructure, um, whether it's a red team infrastructure, C2 infrastructure, all those things, test it out, right? Make sure that, uh, um, you know, obviously make sure that um, it's it's non attributable and those, those sorts of things, um, that it works as expected. So you might evade detection, you might not. Uh, if you don't, then it's most likely game over. Uh, you may get a call back, you might, you might not. Again, something might have happened where <coughs> um, it prevented that callback. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things here is that when you get those callbacks or you don't get them per se, um, you have typically no visibility, right? Um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, you typically have no visibility uh, into uh, kind of what uh, what that callback, you know, uh, really the, the the thing that prevented that callback or the thing that prevented, you know, the success of the actual phishing campaign. That's going to come into play here uh, here in a second, but. Um, and so I guess before you dive into this, this yeah, uh, slide here, Chris. Um, <clears throat> so let's maybe talk a little bit about some of those things that, that, that uh, we run into uh, specific uh, security controls and whatnot that we actually have to evade, right? The sandboxing, the egress, all, all those 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 types of things. Do you want to kind of talk about what what it is that we're trying to address with some of our more customized infrastructure rather than using the commodity base? Yeah, and we, we will, Dan. Let's uh, let's uh, kind of fast track. We'll go through some of these things and then we'll talk about like what can be better, right? Um, we'll do that here in a second. Um, so with that generic. Before we get into kind of uh, what Dan had just mentioned, um, so with that generic approach, I guess what uh, really what what we're trying to get at here is that when you're doing <clears throat> when you're doing a phishing campaign and you're doing it uh, in that kind of approach, right? As you move into something that's more uh, more complex, right? So say for instance, we're kind of talking about a nation state. Uh, now, when you're doing this as a more adversarial based engagement, not only are you testing the people but you're also testing kind of the instrumentation you're testing the processes right um you're testing things like the ability to uh really kind of detect suppress uh eradicate um those are all those other processes that are kind of foregone they're missed right um i pick on this um this is uh this is app 33 and really the biggest thing uh, it's an iranian app but the biggest thing here is just up on the upper left hand corner it's the spear phishing link right they do a bunch of interesting things um when they deliver their payload um, but you know, some of the things that they end up doing is they use their own, uh, <clears throat> they use kind of their own droppers. They used a lot of their own, uh, intellectual property, but they also use some publicly available intellectual property as well. And they kind of mix that, uh, and execute, uh, execute those, those sorts of, uh, those sorts of items to make, uh, make for the actual spear phishing, uh, uh, operate for operationalizing that actual spear phishing engagement. And making it more complex, right? And that's really what we want to emulate, right? Because what we feel is that you know, just doing generic phishing attacks and things like that, or doing generic phishing campaigns, doesn't ne necessarily lend itself or is viable um, when we're talking about you know something that's more complicated like this. And we're trying to protect our clients, right? Rightfully so, we need to protect our clients uh, and you know just you know the individuals that are entrust that um, entrust us to actually actually protect them. Uh, to be able to, you know, be knowledgeable about how to better execute some of these phishing engagements, right? So, so what could we do? What could we do better? Um, so here's some of the offensive challenges, and this is Dan. I think, um, you know, this yeah. is what you were talking about earlier, right? Um, you want to roll through these? Um, yeah, yeah, you bet. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, some of the challenges um, that we run into. So if, if we're trying to do kind of a commodi commoditized test where we're just tracking metrics, a lot of these don't even come into play, right? They'll kind of do a shields down approach test where they, you know, they whitelist the, the source email, um, or the source domain for, for email delivery and things like that. So we can actually kind of avoid a lot of these things. But what we're actually trying to do when we, we perform threat replication or emulation during our adversarial simulations, you know, we just have to assume that that every single security control is is in place and it's it's um, it's fairly effective. Right. And so what we want to do is essentially stress test 
test the efficacy of each one of those security controls by customizing everything we're doing as part of the infrastructure build and the email delivery, right? So, um, you know, just a, a, a listing here of some of the things that, uh, that, that we have, uh, you know, challenges that we need to, uh, you know, bake into some of these campaigns and, and uh, the build is we have to remain non-attributable. Um, so a big part of our adversarial simulations when we do them, and probably, you know, other folks too, is the engagement is, is geared towards testing the incident response of the organization itself. And so by trying to remain non-attributable, the organization has to kind of, you know, pick through the information, try to tie together, you know, uh, different endpoints that, that we're calling out to and try to, you know, put that story together internally and kind of measure exactly how effective they are at, at figuring that out, right? And tying a campaign back to a specific threat actor. In this case, it would be us, right? So a lot of times when we, we go in and do these engagements, um, the actual incident response folks, the EIM folks, they don't actually know the engagement's going on, right? Um, that would compromise the integrity of, of the engagement itself. So uh, what we try to do is kind of measure that, uh, that time um, from initial payload or initial email delivery through detection and attribution, right? And so you have to take a, a lot of steps there to kind of scrub documents, uh, stand up temporary domains that aren't tied to you, anonymize them, you know, privatize uh, the registries and things like that. Um, also the, the command and control integration. Um, so, you know, specifically trying to establish a command and control, it, assuming that is part of, of the, uh, you know, the desired outcome is to actually get a shell and not just credentials, um, you know, baking that in, in a way that's not going to get detected, detected by, uh, you know, EDR, or antivirus, um, things like that. So a lot of times, you know, canned off the shelf type, type products, your Metasploits, Cobalt Strikes, if they're not customized, they're going to get picked up right away. So we have to, we have to work a little bit harder to evade those, those type of controls. Um, and then we also need to, um, so the optics, this is a little bit kind of, kind of refers back to the non-attributable uh, portion of it, right? But uh, trying to actually help the blue team uh, measure their, um, their optics case of capabilities. Um, are they seeing everything that's occurring? Um, did they miss any information that might be critical in, in, in recreating the attack chain um, and figuring out, uh, you know, what, uh, what type of incident response they actually have to take? Um, and that's fairly, that's, that's, there's a lot of information to sift through and, and we find, I think, commonly that that's one that is one of the biggest challenges for some of the organizations we, we, we test. I think, uh, yeah, especially with the blue team hunt and higher optics, that portion of it. Um, if you're familiar with us, there, there's a couple of folks from uh, the Netherlands, right? And they, uh, they created uh, the Red Elk. I hope I'm getting this right. Um, they created that Red Elk project. Um, mm -hmm. And really kind of one thing that I really liked about that project was the ability uh, for uh, them to really kind of focus on uh, collecting statistics around what the blue team was seeing, right? You know, a lot of times we always focus on the, the red team uh, and really kind of, you know, what we, what we perceive to be happening. But then when we have visibility into kind of what we know the blue team to be uh, performing and what the hunt team is performing, uh, that adds a whole, uh, whole nother level of uh, our ability to, uh, to really kind of get insight into execution, so. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, and then let's let's talk about sandboxing. So this is probably one of the biggest one ones of, of recent years is um, detonating payloads in in sandboxes, right? So um, you know you send an email, you know links are automatically uh, uh, you know interrogated to to see if there's any kind of uh, you know domain categorization to see if if the contents are safe uh, when we deliver a, a word document. Uh, you know it'll be detonated. Uh, within a sandbox box itself to see what type of uh, outbound calls are being made, if there's anything malicious occurring, right? So we have to design our campaign in a way that addresses this. Um, so there's there's a number of steps that uh, that you can take to actually detect sandboxes kind of outside of, of you know, anything too advanced by, you know, creating a, you know, too complicated of a macro. So what we've done is, is kind of baked in some, some of that solution into the infrastructure side of things to, to kind of better whitelist um, and blacklist uh, IP addresses and, and, and things that might be trying to pull down remote payloads. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of talk about that here in a little bit. But, um, and that, that goes kind of hand in hand with this preemptive network mapping, trying to figure out uh, 
the source uh, network range that uh, that your organization um, that your target is actually originating from. Uh, this can this can pay uh, dividends when trying to execute uh, you know your payload. So you've got sandbox IP addresses which are going to differ from the actual organization's NATed IP address. And so being able to kind of detect that and then um, you know track connectivity and uh, payload delivery based off of what that expected range is. Um, can kind of help you more intelligently deliver the payload to the intended recipient rather than like a security company that's trying to detonate, detonate it. Um, and then controlling the kill chain. Chris, you want to talk about uh, about that one a little bit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, so when when we're executing, um, it's basically just uh, you know again as we're going through the entire process of the you know, up the phishing campaign, uh, when we're going through the process of trying to establish a C2, um, those, those types of things. And then also differentiating or discerning between the access that we want and the access that we don't want. So again, going back to say, for instance, your sandbox, right? You've got a Palo Alto or something like that that reaches back out and you definitely don't want that to uh, be gaining access or you've got virus total or whatever uh, it might be. You don't want that gaining access to uh, any of your payloads the ability to uh, proactively uh, kind of kind of get in line and control that um, for a better chance of actually successfully uh, executing uh, the campaign. Um, that's really that's really what we want to uh, what we want to happen, right? We don't want to, uh, or at least minimize a bunch of the surprises uh, during the uh, the overall <clears throat> execution. So. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about some smarter infrastructure items. Okay, so um, kind of we talked about some of the problems, and this is uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is take take a lot of the lessons learned that uh, you know, a lot of the lessons learned that we you know kind of uh, encountered during fishing, and you know some of the. Uh, uh, some of the red teaming exercises and put that together into uh, into a proxy because that's probably one of the biggest things that uh, we can do uh, to control how callbacks and really kind of you know how the uh, established how the how the established um, fish the payload uh, you know the C two environment a lot of those sorts of things how all of that is orchestrated. Um, and the biggest thing is obviously abstraction through a proxy. So what we ended up doing is we created something called Red Proxy. Uh, and right now it's kind of in its alpha form. Um, we're going to release this, put this uh, on a uh, on on the Stack Titan GitHub. Um, haven't pushed it yet, uh, but after this, uh, you know, after the whole kernel con thing, we'll get it uh, we'll get it up there this week. Um, <clears throat> but so right now, what we have baked into it uh, is the ability to do blacklist and whitelist filtering. Um, there's basically manual and auto enroll. Um, so this will control uh, essentially who's allowed to access uh, at a proxy level. Um, that's gonna sit out in front of your C2. It's gonna sit out in front of your, um, you know, your your uh, uh, phishing, uh, basically your phishing application that's actually feeding, you know, any of your payloads, any of your documents, any of your weaponized, uh, you know, anything, right? Uh, you've got user agent filtering. Again, if you've got uh, an office document, um, then there's probably going to be, you know, there's going to be an office user agent. So if you only want office documents to reach out and grab, you know, that, that particular payload, uh, then at that point you can do user agent uh, filtering. And then if, you know, say for instance, you've got someone from, you know, blue team or something like that and reaches back out, but they're coming from Mozilla, right. Then, uh, the nice thing about the user agent filtering is it's conditional. Uh, meaning that uh, if you've got the right document reaches out, then it's going to access the appropriate payload. If you've got the wrong user agent that reaches out, then you can uh, reverse proxy to some other location. Um, you just have to configure it and you're off, you know, kind of off to the races. And that's kind of what that conditional reverse proxying uh, is uh, uh, able to do. And you can, you can apply that to kind of a number of uh, different, uh, different use cases as well. Um, <clears throat> you've got some direct download prevention, um, which means that if they, it, it's almost behavioral analytics at this point, right? So if you've got someone who, uh, direct goes to try to directly download, uh, uh, you know, a portion of a document, maybe, uh, maybe it's the actual stage or whatever it is, right? They try to go and directly download that. Uh, if it didn't go through the right course of action, uh, such as, you know, entering their credentials to uh, a malicious site, uh, and then, 
uh, again, you know, uh, gaining access to the Word document, the Word documents, open macros, you know, macros enabled, those sorts of things. If they didn't actually go through all of those steps, then, and, and then they turn around, they go and they try to directly download and fast track or short circuit, it's going to prevent them from uh, gaining access. Um, and then you've got uh, kind of, again, behavior-based content serving. Uh, it's kind of along those same, those same lines. Um, for the target organization public NAT detection, um, this is basically uh, what we're doing here is we're doing pixel, pixelation, pixelation um, which is essentially we're, we're, we're loading pixels into basically all of the, uh, uh, all of the preemptive uh, emails. We call it, that's kind of a preemptive strike. So essentially what we want to do is uh, we want to kind of understand the NATed address of the organization before we actually send in anything uh, malicious. Um, so what Red Proxy will do is if we have a pixel that reaches back out, uh, it grabs the source IP address and then it looks up the organizational information. And if that organizational information actually matches the target that we want, then we know that we have uh, a pretty good indication that we have the, uh, the NAD address of the organization. Um, and that's, that's real time. Uh, and then the, uh, the uh, I think the last thing that's baked into it is the real-time interaction with Twilio SMS uh, notifications. So Twilio, third-party uh, service that allows us to, uh, you know, it's basically a uh, telephony service, VoIP uh, service that also allows uh, SMS. Um, so we can push the ability to approve or disprove, um, or approve or deny uh, any of the, uh, the, the blacklist, whitelist access. You know, we can make that call on the fly uh, as they're coming into the uh, into the proxy. <clears throat> and this is kind of a um, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a, a just a, um, a you know, like it's apology of kind of how this thing how this thing works, right? Um, so on the upper left hand corner uh, for preemptive uh, portion, you know, for if we're if we're executing a fish engagement on a preemptive. Uh, portion of the phishing engagement before we send in any malicious payloads, we're going to add a pixel uh, to, uh, to an email. Uh, and typically what we'll do is so someone will, you know, it's, it's going to be either like a request for information and really something that's innocuous. Um, we send it in a lot of times it'll look like a V card and the V card doesn't necessarily render. So, you know, like when someone attaches their V card, their business card, that sort of thing, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily render. They need additional information. You have to have something that entices them to open it up then they, they need additional uh, information. Uh, so they try to click it, it fires, uh, or try to load, I'm sorry, they try to load that uh, um, that pixel or whatever it is, uh, and it fires back out to uh, red proxy. Uh, and then we start the process of looking for uh, if that if it's actually coming from the, uh, the appropriate matted address of the organization, if it's being passed around to different individuals, a lot of times what we'll end up seeing uh, is that someone will get it, but they'll, um, you know, they, they might get it on their phone, they might get it at home, uh, that sort of thing. So we'll, uh, um, we'll have visibility into that until we actually get the right, um, kind of the right IP address, the right NAT and IP address. Uh, we'll just continue kind of watching and, and kind of uh, keeping those metrics, right? Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about this also is as we're kind of going through the preemptive strike, um, or the preemptive email uh, phishing campaign, we're also logging everything. Um, so Red Proxy logs uh, absolutely everything that it, uh, that it interprets or that it sees uh, kind of across its interface. Um, that, one of the things that we often get asked um, during the phishing, uh, phishing engagements, you know, kind of post-mortem is a lot of the uh, a lot of blue teams, a lot of hunt teams, you know, when we're, uh, when we're working with, you know, so for instance, you know, socks and that sort of thing, they want to be able to reconcile that information back. Um, so we'll, we'll timestamp everything, um, <clears throat> the command, the, the request, the response that came in, um, those sorts of things. And that way we can kind of go back and we can say, hey, you know, this is this is what happened. Um, this is all the rest of the cruft that actually happened as well. Um, and we can we can either filter that out uh, either before the engagement, if we know like what, you know, IP, basically blacklist, whitelist, all that sort of stuff, or we can just kind of log everything and then kind of go through it with them. Uh, at the at the end of the engagement. All right. So once we have uh, the actual matted address, um, then at that point we can actually operationalize um, <clears throat> the uh, the phishing campaign. This is actually where the rubber, you know, obviously the rubber meets the road, right? Um, so uh, I don't know, Dan, you want to kind of walk through kind of some of 
some of the operational aspects of it? Yeah, yeah. So let's, uh, <clears throat> I guess maybe before we, we we go through the specifics of of like the tooling, let's talk about kind of how this this tool came to be specific to the uh, the assessment that we were performing. So, you know, we ran into a number of of different issues, and and we assumed the worst. Um, and well, pretty much the best security was in place, right? And so we had to kind of address a number of different concerns that we had. Um, regarding the security that they might have in place. So we assumed that they probably had some type of, of tool to check site categorization uh, to make sure that whatever callbacks were going out, uh, you know, it was an approved site per their, their policy, right? Um, we also assumed that whatever uh, Word document um, that was going to be sent via email uh, would run within a sandbox um, and Quite honestly, we don't actually attach Word documents to, to emails anymore because rarely will a uh, like a macro enabled document actually get delivered. Uh, so we needed a different method to actually get a Word document macro uh, to the user. Um, so a lot of times, um, you know, what we'll do is is we'll have that as kind of a downloadable link, right? Um, but we wanted to make sure that uh, you know we were controlling. Uh, who was actually able to, to access that macro, uh, who was actually able to detonate it. So we needed a way to kind of uh, more or less create kind of our own CAPTCHA type uh, scenario. We needed to be able to, to tell whether it was a human or a computer executing uh, each, each one of these steps, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that we could get through uh, the initial email delivery to, uh, you know, we could control the, the uh, download of the document that we could also capture user credentials because there were some exposed single factor uh, portals on, on the perimeter network that we could potentially uh, abuse as well. Um, we wanted the ability to try to execute a word macro and gain a shell back. Um, so in this kind of assuming all of all of the security was in place for their egress controls and sandboxing and everything like that, you know, we took these steps to to really make it kind of non non attributable and also to uh, kind of control each one of those very granularly, right? Um, so the campaign that we ended up putting together, and we'll talk specifically about um, about how this fits into to the tooling was. Um, as Chris talked about, the uh, kind of that preemptive strike was the reconnaissance phase where we sent out an email to essentially just capture the NATed IP address range so that we knew what we could actually whitelist where all the authorized traffic should originate from from um, our target, right? We didn't, uh, you know, sandboxes um, will commonly spin up in AWS or some other cloud provider. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, whatever was coming back to us was from a legitimate, like, organizational registered uh, uh, IP space. Um, so we sent out the, the, the preemptive email to capture the, uh, uh, the source IP. And then um, our actual Spearfish campaign itself, um, the, you know, it, it, it captured a ruse uh, relative to the, the organization and the current time, um, directing them to a website um, that was a legitimately registered domain name. Uh, we went out of our way to actually have have the site uh, cloned from um, one of the organizational sites, uh, one of the organization's uh, legitimate sites that was a single factor authentication page. Uh, we submitted it for categorization to, I think it was Palo Alto, Blue Coat, uh, maybe some of the other providers just to get it categorized as a legitimate uh, uh, source, right? Because a lot of times uh, organizations will by default kind of block uh, uncategorized uh, posts or uh, domains. Um, so we took all those steps to direct the user to an authentication portal that did some credential harvesting. Um, so as part of, of our desire to um, kind of differentiate between, uh, you know, true victims and those that are kind of suspicious of the ruse, we baked into the, the credential harvesting site uh, like a two or three password attempt. Uh, it would tell you basically an invalid password. So more often than not, somebody gets suspicious of a campaign when it gets uh, you know passed around internally. Um, you'll get a sysadmin or somebody, uh, you know, security professional goes out there from the organization and then tries to log in using some bogus credentials, basically just to troll us. You know, it, you know, he knows that it's it, it's a fake thing. So we baked in you know, multiple iterations of uh, basically 
telling them that they they fat fingered their their password, right? Invalid password. So uh, kind of increases the the legitimacy of of the actual site, right? Like we're we're actually performing authentication, but really we're just capturing the credentials, logging them to files. So after a couple of attempted login uh, uh, login attempts to this portal, uh, that's when we direct them to the uh, the Ward document download. Um, so this was kind of the hidden behind authentication, fake authentication, right? Um, so that's one way where if anything in that initial email was, was running uh, in a sandbox anywhere, was uh, browsing to the site, at no point were they actually, was, was any kind of automated tooling going to see that there was going to be a Word document accessible. Um, all it, it looked like a legitimate authentication portal. So when the Word doc is, is downloaded and executed on the, on the computer's machine, there was a number of different things we did. So first of all, we scrubbed all the metadata from the Word document itself. Uh, we baked in some ways to kind of obfuscate some of the, uh, the information so that the, uh, the destinations um, to which the, the macro would actually um, call out to were, were obfuscated. Um, so to make it a little bit harder to detect, um, we created a custom payload. It was uh, based off of the dot, .NET to JS um, uh, tool. So, um, but it was, it was heavily customized to avoid uh, detection by, you know, EDR products. Um, and then we also had kind of a multi-phase download where we try to download multiple payloads from different cloud fronted. Um, it was just on cloud front. It was, it wasn't domain fronting, but it was on uh, behind cloud front. Um, and we try to pull down uh, different raw payloads for execution. Uh, prior to that actually being allowed though, uh, we baked into uh, the word document um, kind of uh, a CAPTCHA type deal, right? We, we, we prompted the, the end user to, um, you know, we popped a message box with a prompt that the user had to actually acknowledge. Um, we felt that that was kind of a way to uh, differentiate whether this was running in a sandbox or not. Uh, we figured a sandbox probably wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily acknowledge those, those types of prompts, right? So if we made it that far, we, we kind of have, have some assurance that you know, the, the subsequent calls for the payloads were originating from a, a user who had gone through those steps. And then, uh, as, as Chris was talking about, we had baked into uh, the red proxy side of that, the, the house, the actual whitelisting and blacklisting of the source IP addresses and user agents so that we, we had another level of assurance that any of the callbacks that we were getting to download these, these payloads that we had, um, that first of all, they had gone through the initial credential harvesting step um, and that uh, second, that they actually proceeded to execute the macro and, and uh, you know, acknowledge the, uh, the prompt. Um, so at that point, you know, we could be relatively sure that it was a, a human uh, that, was, that was executing the payload. Um, if there was any level of doubt that, uh, uh, that it was a human, if, for instance, it came from um, an, an unknown source IP address or, um, the user agent was was incorrect, or perhaps we didn't have record of them going through the actual download step or entering user credentials. Um, that's where we baked in the Twilio SMS notification, where it would actually send uh, Chris and myself uh, text messages saying, "Hey, you know, I received a request to download this document from this IP address, this this user agent, or whatever." Uh, I, yeah. So Chris has a has a. Uh, uh, an image there on the right side of the, the slide kind of demonstrates, you know, we get a, a prompt and then of course time is of the essence because the, the user is waiting for their, their document. So we get that on our phones um, and then we can approve or deny it on the spot um, and, and either allow payload execution or, or say it's kind of an untrusted source, right? Um, so that's, that was kind of the, the flow of the actual execution that led us to kind of the creation of some of these, uh, you know, bypass ideas or I guess multi-leveled multi uh, um, kind of approach to, you know, allowing payloads to execute. So, you know, we talked about like the real-time Twilio approval uh, in the event that uh, it was an unrecognized source trying to execute or didn't go through the, the entire process. So we, we baked that in. The NAT address detection, that was part of uh, the initial uh, preemptive reconnaissance, uh, you know, benign email that we sent, simply just to kind of capture that. You know, and a lot of times we might be able to, to deduce that just by uh, looking at public records and whatnot, but uh, just to, to 
be sure uh, we fire that uh, that reconnaissance email just uh, you know to get some peace of mind on that. And one of, one of the nice things about uh, firing that reconnaissance email, not only do we get uh, an opportunity to capture the MAD IP address, um, but a lot of times you know when you're kind of firing, say for instance, benign email, then you'll also get back things like signature blocks, right? Um, which uh, again adds more legitimacy when you're uh, you know if. If you're going to spoof, uh, say for instance, you know one of the internal folks, that sort of thing, right? It just gives you a little, little bit uh, or, or additional pieces of information that you can use uh, when you're trying to go through your actual legitimate, uh, your legitimate campaign. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and then uh, credential harvesting, uh, we'll almost always bake this into to an engagement, like I said, because uh, you know Word documents or macro enabled documents generally don't get pushed through email gateways, uh, not nearly as reliably as they used to. So having user credentials a lot of times is all it takes to, to compromise an organization. And, you know, we, we pick on O365, but a big part of that is because a lot of times uh, organizations won't enable multi-factor authentication. And so just grabbing a single set of user credentials opens up a whole world of additional attack vectors through O65. So I know the, um, you know, Microsoft's policy is changing to, to have some default uh, MFA enabled for, for new accounts and everything, but you know, we run into this an awful lot where um, there could be multiple endpoints, um, uh, you know, EWS or, or whatever, I guess that's uh, probably not 0365, but there's a, there's a number of different uh, endpoints that can be exposed that, that have mixed for, uh, you know, single factor or multi-factor auth, depending on, on their actual setup, right? So getting a single set of user credentials, if we can access a user's mailbox, even if we don't get a shell, a lot of times that's all we need to get an initial foothold some other way. So it's it's crazy how how uh, regularly we actually see additional user credentials communicated via email. Um, we can actually execute additional spearfish uh, campaigns from the user's email address, which will bypass and you know additional uh, security controls, um, specifically documents originating with like the Mark of the Web, um, you know, coming from from an organizational email address. Uh, kind of lower some of those security defenses. So, and sometimes that's that's really all we need. Um, so, I mentioned the CloudFront abstraction. So, this is a big one. We we use CloudFront quite a bit for our callbacks. Uh, so, if you're not familiar, CloudFront is an Amazon uh, microservice in AWS um, that is used for like caching and and storing static content, specific, I believe. So, for like websites and whatnot. Um, so we can you can actually disable like the the caching of it, so it'll it'll you know refresh every time. So what we actually do is we'll use CloudFront because you get a vanity CloudFront uh, domain name, uh, and CloudFront is categorized by you know Blue Coat and Palo Alto and whatnot. So we're guaranteed to have a categorized um, uh, domain um, just by by calling back to that, and it's also extremely difficult for organizations to blacklist uh, anything um, from CloudFront. If they do that, uh, it'll probably break a bunch of different websites. And so it's it's not really kind of a realistic fix, right? So we'll hide a lot of our, our uh, C2 callbacks behind CloudFront. And a lot of times what we'll do is, if it's in this case, the, the scenario we described in terms of the, the campaign, we had multiple callbacks coming for different pieces of the payload. And so we would put those, uh, each one of those behind a different CloudFront instance just to make it a little bit more difficult for uh, incident responders to triage the issue, right? They, they, they couldn't necessarily piece it together because now you're dealing with multiple domains and you have a puzzle to put together. So it buys us a little bit of time. Yeah, and I think one of the aspects too, um, you know, around the, <clears throat> around the CloudFront piece um, is that there is kind of decision-based like for Red Proxy, right? There's uh, decision-based uh, reverse proxying. Um, so again, there's that level of, um, uh, what is it, uh, you know, there, there's that, so if, if you've got, say for instance, a blue team or you got a hunt team guy that comes back and they're like looking at, and they're looking at the different components of your, of your phishing campaign and, uh, they're trying to uh, triage everything. Right. Um, and based on the conditional reverse proxy, they go to something, they haven't met that certain criteria, they haven't met the user agent criteria, they haven't met the, uh, the whitelist criteria or whatever. Now we can send them to another location, and now we've got a we've got a level of misdirection, right? Um, that they at that point, you know, it's kind of it's a bit confusing. They have to go back and they're like, okay, what the hell's happening? Um, those sorts of things, and it kind of uh, sends them down a different path again. While we're uh, buying us some time to actually, you know, uh, 
clean whatever we're trying to clean. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Um, okay, so we also, the, yeah, we talked a little bit about the, the black and white uh, filtering um, in terms of source IP addresses, user agents, um, and those are both gathered in automated, auto, automatic and, uh, or automated and manual um, fashion. So the manual being the reconnaissance piece, uh, the, the, that initial recon email, um, and it's also manual through Twilio, right? So we have two different ways to kind of manually add those on, on the fly as part of the entire execution. And then we had some automated things baked in um, to, to Red Proxy as well that, uh, you know, if, if the source IP address is, is you know, gone through uh, the prerequisite steps, um, then we can kind of uh, be sure that it's coming from an authorized, uh, you know, IP and that it, it can be whitelisted, right? Um, also, the design of the actual shell code, um, and, uh, the execution of it within your macro. Uh, like I said, we use .NET to JS, but it was highly obfuscated, so it would bypass, you know, basic signatures. Um, it's still uh, subject to getting caught, but um, you know, we made sure that we were doing some in-memory in execution of the the pieces that we would consider to be, uh, you know, malicious. Uh, protecting the download of of the document itself. So again, you can only download the word document after having quote unquote authenticated to our credential harvesting site, which was hosted outside of AWS, right, on a, a different domain. Um, so that that controlled who actually had the ability to, to execute it. Now, it wasn't truly protected um, by authentication. You could directly browse to it, but it was in a you know, a path that was supposed to be fairly well protected. So it was, uh, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit harder to, to maybe guess, guess that path. Uh, categorized URLs to, to bypass things like uh, Blue Coat and, and Palo Alto, uh, egress controls, user agent filtering, you mentioned that. Um, yeah, the decoupled and the keyed ma macros. So that, that goes back to how we were actually allowing the delivery of, of the macros via via Twilio, um, having the ability to kind of on the fly say, yeah, this, this source IP address from this host name and domain is allowed to execute this payload. So that that's kind of a key one, because if you get anything running in a sandbox, it'll, it generally has some kind of bogus information in terms of the, the current user it's running as or the current domain. So something looks a little bit off. So a lot of times, you know, we'll embed that information in the actual request itself to say that uh, you know you're getting a request from this user on this domain, uh, do you want to approve it, right? And so it, it makes it a little bit easier to know whether you're actually dealing with a, a, the client organization or just some some built-in account running Windows, right? Um, I mentioned kind of the CAPTCHA protection that we put in place to try to uh, just control whether uh, you know automated uh, you know computers or whatever are, are executing our payloads or whether it's act, actual human. And then we made, made a point to actually uh, create uh, valid TLS certificates, um, which meant that we, you know, we procured a domain name um, and then uh, we use Let's Encrypt, um, you know, free, free certificates. Why not? It's, uh, it makes our job a lot easier to actually be able to encrypt the traffic um, using a legitimate cert um, that won't necessarily get blocked, right? It's recognized as authentic. All right, Chris, I kind of, I don't know, I went through those kind of quick. Yeah, Anything you want to add? Yeah, I think that's good. Um, so some of these things obviously are decoupled from the actual proxy itself. Uh, those are, those are things that you have to consider and you've got to bake into, or you have to build into, uh, you know, your, your, uh, I don't know, your actual payload, right? Um, so whenever you're sending your, you know, your weaponized payload, you got to consider that uh, when you're building out your document, um, you know, when you're building out your macro, when you're building out whatever it might, whatever it might be, right? Um, the only thing is that you know, Red Proxy is kind of uh, intended to be customizable, um, and uh, that that portion of it is decoupled. So there's going to have to be some thought process between the two, um, because we don't know everyone's campaign. Um, we know our campaigns. We know how we execute. This is kind of our methodology, right? Um, how we uh, how we typically do things. It helps us enable or it helps enable us to um, uh, kind of control, like, like I, we had mentioned earlier, it helps us kind of control the overall flow of uh, how these campaigns run. Um, 
but again, kind of what we've ended up doing is packing as much as we possibly can uh, when it comes to, say, for instance, black, white filtering, user agent filtering, download protections, um, those, you know, wh whatever it might be, uh, into middleware. Um, and the middleware uh, is basically uh, just a, a convenient means to wrap all of the all of these things are going to be kind of going towards uh, uh, routes on the proxy. So you're going to hit an endpoint. Um, and when you hit that endpoint, that middleware uh, is actually, or that, that particular route is subject to the middleware um, that is, you know, say for instance, you know, from, uh, are you authorized from a, from a whitelist perspective? If not, then you're subject to blacklist, which could in turn, uh, uh, you could be relegated to something like uh, reverse proxy to another site, uh, which again, you know, kind of forces some sort of misdirection or something like that to, to lead them down a different path. Um, but, uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, this is this is alpha code. Uh, we've ran this on uh, on engagements, um, but uh, we'll get it pushed uh, to GitHub. I think one of the questions was uh, that um, you know where's the link for the red proxy? We'll push it to the Stack Titan GitHub uh, after after KernelCon, uh, and then uh, you guys can uh, you guys can use it. You can uh, beat it up, do whatever you need to do. Um, so I think. Uh, you know, kind of in closing, um, really kind of tactical execution should be well planned. We believe in that. Um, and then we uh, believe that um, you should you should put a lot of thought process into your C2 infrastructure. This isn't just, you know, that, that proxy or the campaign uh, aspect, but it's also uh, overall the entire C2 uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then um, Again, uh, if you can pull down trials, all that kind of stuff. If you can't, um, you know, try to try to structure your your overall execution, your campaign, um, to something that you rely on, that you believe in, uh, and then test it, and then test it again until you feel comfortable with it. And then once we get this thing put up, uh, once we get Red Proxy or whatever put up on uh, or committed to uh, to our GitHub site, um, by all means, pull requests, contribute, whatever you need to do. Um, I'm super excited and stoked about. Um, Kind of uh, hearing your guys' thoughts on what would be really really cool to add uh, to uh, to the features and and you know help to help enable your campaigns. So with that said, um, I don't know, Tim uh, guys, do we have time for time for questions? Um, yeah, yep, we got time for a couple of questions. You, you addressed the one they're looking for the link, um, okay. and uh, you said you know you'll get to that later. Yeah, right um, this is sort of the 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 release of the tool, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so uh, already thanks for that one. Um, there's a couple of others. One was sort of a clarification question earlier on. You're you're sort of comparing approaches and um, saying I think at one point Dan said the generic approach. Uh, when you say that, are you referring to like a particular vendor or something like Cofence or Wombat or something? Yeah, I mean, it, I just I guess I mean more of the uh, kind of that that canned the canned approach that come out of a lot of different uh, commodity tools. Where you don't necessarily get to customize, customize the actual, um, you know, the payload, and and take some of these these steps to actually bypass and, uh, you know, some of the detective and preventative controls. I think um, that maybe they're a little bit more uh, uh, geared towards uh, metrics tracking than it is actual threat emulation. Is kind of I guess what I was talking about. Gotcha. And then um, you know a bit of a heavier question. Um, it's about your testing methodology. Like, you know, as with everything else, this tends to be sort of a, an arms race or a cat and mouse game, you know, it's a game of evasion. So um, how do you, what's your process look like for testing your payloads, um, especially against platforms that you don't really get sort of control of both ends? Like you can't download the software or some service where you can't see the output. <laughs> Spray and pray. No. Um, <laughs> Um, no, so I, I think probably the biggest thing is if we can uh, get trials uh, to the uh, to the software that we're uh, that we're targeting, uh, by all means we will do that. Uh, again, you know, uh, from an EDR standpoint or uh, whatever you know that might look like, we'll try to get trials to again all of those or actually purchase legit licenses. Um, I think it's I think it's the best effort, right? I mean, if we can get uh, if we can get something like that, if we can get close to uh, what we're targeting, then we'll do that. Um, or we might shift the way that we actually, uh, what we're actually looking at, right? So if we, if we've got another uh, option to look at some, you know, like a different, different kind of technology that we have access to, we'll shift our focus to something like that, right? It's sometimes it just really depends, I guess. Um, and that's a, that's a really crappy answer, but 
Uh, it really depends on the significance of what we're after, right? I mean, if we're going to burn, if we're going to burn our tech, uh, going after something that we don't necessarily need to burn, burn it for, right? Then we're not going to jeopardize that because there's a lot mm-hmm. of work that goes into these campaigns and that sort of thing. So we'll shift focus onto something else that we think that's going to protect our trade craft. Yeah, and I, I think a, a lot of that too is a lot of the security products. You know, maybe with the exception of like EDR and stuff, it, there's there's kind of common patterns that that we can use to maybe by, bypass or it's almost doing your due diligence to take those steps that have commonly been known to bypass those controls. For instance, I, I like, you know, the blue coat Palo Alto concept is pretty straightforward to me. Like having a site categorized as something, for instance, uh, like a banking or financial application is absolutely ideal for a couple of reasons. First of all, if they're blocking uncategorized sites, well, you, you bypass that part. If they're doing any kind of SSL inspection, if it's a financial site, a lot of times, um, you know, those those kind of tools won't actually peer into those because it might open it up to like PCI considerations if you're actually, you know, you know violating um, kind of that, that security of, of the in-transit data, right? So just kind of based off the experience, now is, is that certain? No, I mean, there's, there's still probably times where that approach is going to fail, but doing our due diligence at least is, I think, what, the, what our customers expect us to do um, in, in terms of, you know, providing a high quality service. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's, there's a lot of times with those sorts of questions, there's certainly not a clear cut answer answer and it gets yeah. into uh, almost uh, religion or theology, right? Like, which yeah. you know, it's, it's a complex situation. Yeah, um, and anymore, I mean, you know, Microsoft Defender has, has made leaps and bounds progress in terms of, of detecting our payloads and whatnot. And it's almost become a thorn in our side where once we get to the point where we can bypass Defender, it's usually momentarily, it only lasts for a little while. So uh, once we can kind of bypass that, we feel like we're in a pretty good state in terms of endpoint security. Now, you know, the tools like uh, like um, uh, CrowdStrike using Overwatch where they have the human element kind of watching all of, all of these steps are more prone to detection, even if it, it evades the initial steps, right? So again, it's just kind of do your due diligence Take all the steps you can to, you know, have some type of confidence that it bypasses some good security products, and then you just move forward with what you got. That's, that's awesome because, like, if you know, if you guys, if you're, uh, if you get the luxury of being able to do some of these things, but also have visibility into, like, say, for instance, the CrowdStrike pane, uh, the dashboard, right? Uh, that's uh, that's awesome because I mean that gives you some that's, that gives you some really really great insight into. Uh, what tools work, what tools don't, that sort of thing, and you can kind of really level up your uh, your overall tool chain. So that's that's a good point. So yeah, it's fun stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, uh, those are the two questions that I had pinned. That, uh, it seemed like we wanted to uh, try and get you in the video on. Um, appreciate your your time coming out, and uh, also the time that you spent in sort of other aspects of the con, like training. We'll have to get you guys out in person next time. Yeah, yeah. our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for sticking around for uh, Bat of Doom. We're going to go on a short afternoon break, and we'll be back for the, uh, the the final session of our technical program. And then don't forget, we do have the mental health hacker sort of uh, post-con activities tonight. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute. <laughs>